Well, thank you for coming out um, for our panel from 4 to 5 today uh, called Available Light, How I Made My Movie in Vermont. We have distinguished filmmakers who will be introduced here shortly by Jay. Uh, before we do that, I'd like to have Joshua Sherman, the publisher of Vermont Magazine and founder of Old Mill Road Studio, come up. We were privileged this year with my team to go down to East Arlington to see this magnificent operation. Um, the recording studio that has been set up in East Arlington by Joshua and his team is absolutely magnificent, first rate, first class, and he's attracting a lot of musicians to come to the state uh, to produce their work. And he and I have spoken about his, his hope for um, doing something similar in film, creating a place where filmmakers can come and create their films, and God knows we could certainly use that in Vermont. So I'd like, without further ado, to welcome the publisher of Vermont Magazine and many other endeavors to the stage, Joshua Sherman. so much for being here. Um, so, uh, you know, Arlington, Vermont has an amazing history. Uh, the revolutionaries uh, met there uh, and uh, came up with some pretty uh, exciting ideas, I think. But even more than that, in the 1950s, 30s, 40s, 50s, five Saturday evening post illustrators all lived in Arlington, Vermont, including Norman Rockwell. And it was really a hub for collaboration and community, and they used their neighbors as their models and told the stories of the community. Um, I think that Old Mill Road Media today really tries to continue that legacy, sharing those stories in Vermont Magazine and our other publications, uh, which are Stratton Magazine, Manchester Life, Berkshire Magazine, and uh, the Vermont News Guide. So, um, as Lloyd said, yes, we have a state-of-the-art recording studio, and of course, how do people access music today? They watch it. So, you know, the truth is building content, telling stories, whether it's telling us, taking you on a journey of an album or watching a great film, it really comes back to the same storytelling that uh, the Saturday Evening Post illustrators all demonstrated in a single frame. So, um, I am so excited uh, when uh, Lloyd came down and we talked about what could happen here, I, I said, well, you know, I've uh, produced quite a bit in Vermont, and there are certain uh, benefits and certain challenges, and I said, why not get some Vermont filmmakers who've made films in Vermont to talk about that? So, uh, welcome today. Uh, I'll introduce Jay Craven, our moderator, and uh, take it away. Thanks so much for having Thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I thought we were going to set a record at the festival for more people on stage than in the audience, but we haven't quite done that, so <laughs> we will. Uh, I thought I would start by just going down the line for everybody to introduce themselves and to say what it is about Vermont that has compelled you or inspired you to make films here. And um, Maybe, maybe we start just with that, then we'll go a second round and see further thoughts. But let's let's start there. So Sydney, you go first. Your name, just you know, just briefly, what you've done and what it is about being in Vermont that inspires and compels you to to make movies here. Okay. Um. It's on. Oh, it's on. Okay. Oh. Uh, my name is Sydney Taylor. I live in Norwich, Vermont, and. Um, I moved to Norwich, Vermont in 2004 with a two-week-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. And I really wanted to make a, to be able to keep working. And I used to teach and I didn't have a teaching degree in Vermont. And I'd seen Circus Circus for years, living in Boston, which is where we moved from. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to make a movie about Circus Circus. And because Vermont is small, I was able to just kind of drive up. I drove up to Greensboro, I met with the people at Leclerc um, at Circus Mercus, and you know, he said, fine, you know, come on. We, we shut down the year before, but we're back, so you can go on tour with us. And, and, I, and, that, and then I went ahead and I, I made that. It was a feature film, a feature documentary. And I think that what Vermont gives you is it gives you a sense of place, a sense of home, and I think also the ability to just 
small. Like, you can do it. You can meet all the people. I could meet everybody at the Vermont Arts Council. I could go to a meeting in Montpelier and sort of see people who I knew from other parts of the state. And I think that the smallness, it was so nice after having lived my whole life in large cities where you have to fight really hard just to meet people. And here, I felt like, and then I also met Nora um, as part of the White River, um, White River Indie Film Festival, RIF, and met this whole community of filmmakers. And I just think it's an amazing place to do work because it's very sane. And then I, I went on and actually made a film in New Hampshire that's called It's Criminal, that's about it, but that's a different film. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nora Jacobson. And I was born in Vermont, actually just across the river in New Hampshire, but my birth certificate says Vermont. And I lived in Vermont most of my life. I did move to Hoboken, New Jersey in the huh, early 80s. And so, and I made a film about Hoboken called Delivered Vacant, which is very much about place, about that little city of Hoboken. Um, I got kicked out of my place where I was living in Hoboken, as many, as many of the people in my film were kicked out as well, and I ended up moving back to Vermont. Um, and I ended up staying in Vermont. I thought I was going to move back to the city, and uh, I ended up staying. Why did I end up staying? Well, just the other day, I mean, on a very practical level, <clears throat> If I'd stayed in the city, I would have had to spend most of my time teaching and working, um, and just a little time making films. And so in Vermont, I was able to sort of change that perspective, and I mean that um, percentage, and spend a lot more time working on my films. Plus, I've always been really interested in place. And so all of my films have been, have had that part of that component of looking around at where you live. I ended up coordinating this massive six-part series called Freedom and Unity, the Vermont Movie, which was a collaborative, collaborative film with many other Vermont filmmakers, and that was all about Vermont. And, but my films after that have all been somehow related to this place, and uh, they still are. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's all I have to say at this point. Uh, hi, my name is Josh um, I moved to Vermont about 12 years ago. Um, and I made a film called Major Arcana a few years ago, which is about a, an itinerant carpenter who returns back to Vermont um, and is newly sober, and he sets about building a log cabin in the woods to prove to his mother and his girlfriend that he's turned his life around. And um, to me what's special about making films in Vermont is the community that that because it's small and because um, and and because there isn't an enormous film industry here or anything like that, uh, that people can be very excited about the idea of a movie. So for this small story that I told, we were able to bring together a lot of people just in the community to help out in all sorts of different ways. Um, and that was just like a fabulous experience, and it was one of the things that I set out to do when I was conceiving of the idea, and the fact that it actually worked, and that people were involved and did help out, and um, uh, made the film become an actual thing is just really special to me. So. Uh, my name is Peter Halvey. I'm with the film Best of River, which um, we shot up in Lincoln, Vermont, where I also live, and also Bristol, Vermont. Uh, it's a movie where half the cast and crew has a disability, and it was really important for us to make it, um, I think, piggyback on yours, like in a, in a community that was going to support our mission and our work and uh, and embrace it and celebrate it and, and we found that everywhere we went and every every home we went to shoot. I 
mean, it's a lot of hustle. They do movies, and you have to ask a lot of favors. And we found in Vermont, everyone was like, oh, yeah, man, that's awesome. Let's do it. Um, and we shut down Main Street Bristol for, you know, till 4 in the morning. And you would never be able to do that in LA. We've, we've done, we've tried, and it cost a fortune. And, 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 and the beauty of Vermont, too. Um, so I'm Liam O'Connor Jenner. I live in Rygate, Vermont, which is where I grew up and have spent a lot of my life. Um, I had a film here called Zephyr back in 2016, and then I just wrapped on another feature called Butterfly Queen, um, both of which shot in the Northeast Kingdom. And yeah, well, the filmmaking in Vermont for me, I think most of what everybody else has already said is, is really about the community and the smallness and the fact that you can get, get away with so much here in this state. Um, you know, you can just go up and say, hey, can you borrow like a tractor trailer bed for a couple days? Uh, we'll bring it back probably. Um, and like, that's, that's totally fine. You can film in, film in people's fields, you can film in people's barns. Um, but for me, it's really like, I love living in this state. Um, and would like to see myself be able to do what I love in this state and continue to do that moving forward. Um, and so for me, making movies in Vermont is, is about being able to continue to make movies in Vermont. So it's like keeping that, that snowball rolling and, and continuing to try to build that for myself as a career here um, and kind of commit to that early. Yeah. Hi. Brad Heck, and I live in southern Vermont in Guilford with Willow. Um, I first came to Vermont to go to Marlboro College where I met Jay in 99, and he took a risk on me and has been, he and Bess have been employing me since. Um, I've worked in Seattle, Chicago, and Brooklyn, and kept on coming back to Vermont, and then fully moved here in 2016. Um, and I mean, I totally agree with what everyone is saying. About, I mean, the relationships with communities that you form here and a lot of other places where you work it's really the film crew comes in and it almost feels like an extractive industry to the location whereas here it really feels like part of the community the community the productions have to involve the community and often the community wants to involve it um, but the main reason that i'm here in vermont is uh, quality of life which i mean film is not the only part of me so I was working on my land, so I was taking long walks, so I was caring about my neighbors and giving to my neighbors. And what I found in my experience is the other places I've made film, the only way you could make film is if film was your life. Um, and I care about it so much more. Hello, my name is Bess O'Brien from Kingdom County Productions. Uh, why do I make films in Vermont? Because I live here. I guess. Can't make films anywhere else because I'm, I live here and I've raised my family here. Um, you know, for me, I agree with everybody else and what they said. Vermont is a very small state. Um, my film career in Vermont has primarily been in documentary uh, around issue-oriented films that focus on things that Vermont is struggling with. Um, whether it's an opiate epidemic or incarceration or uh, youth issues or whatever. Um, and I have been extremely privileged and lucky to be able to have found a way to fund those films through um, very close collaborations with state agencies like the Department of Health, the Department of Corrections, uh, big organizations like Blue Cross Blue Shield um, and the Department of Children and Families. And so I've been lucky, I think, couldn't do it probably in most other places, certainly couldn't, it would be very difficult to do it in urban, big urban areas. In Vermont, you can actually set up a conversation with the governor, you can set up a conversation with the, the uh, Department of Children and Families Commissioner. Um, and you can sit down with them and say, I have a documentary film that I would really like to make and I think you should be involved with it. So I've been really lucky to forge those collaborations and um, I also tour my films extensively through the state. Um, and that is also something that would be very difficult to do in Texas. <laughs> um, 
when I tour my films to 20 or 30 or even 15 towns, um, you can actually start a conversation in Vermont because Vermont is such a small area that as people see the film, they start to talk to their neighbors and somebody in another county. And so you can actually, as a filmmaker, as a documentary filmmaker, see your films create dialogue and even create change, which is really exciting. Um, and to do it within your own community. Um, so that's been really, really wonderful to be able to do. Um, hi, I'm Willow O'Farrell, and I live with Brad in Guilford, in southern Vermont. And um, I'm from Northern California, but I came to Vermont uh, in 2003 to attend Marlboro College. And Jay was one of my, my closest one of the professors I worked with the closest, and I connected really deeply with the Vermont community when I was going to college, graduated in 2007, worked on Bess's film in 2007 where I met Brad and we became friends, but then I came back to work on Jay's film, Northern Borders, and Brad and I fell in love, and that so it's like, Jay, Bess, Jay. We're matchmakers, we're matchmakers. And we, yeah, we make documentaries and then work on other people's projects and make other kinds of, um, films as well, but uh, I made, like right after Trump was elected, I was super enraged and um, a bunch of women uh, and I got together and started like a, the women's action team, the acronym TWAT in Battle Row, and we were just agitating and doing semi-illegal things and stuff, and I started a documentary project called Break the Silence, which played at Middlebury, and it was very much a cooperative, like everyone saying, the whole town kind of pulled together to find diverse voices, trans and cis women, you know, of all different kinds of backgrounds, ages, talking about their sexual and reproductive lives as a way to combat um, the encroachment on women's rights that Trump and, you know, it was in the middle of the Me Too movement and stuff like that. So I really felt like, I mean, I was the major force behind the documentary, but the whole community pulled together to find other, you know, women that weren't necessarily coming forward offering their stories, they would like coax them into the project and it was just an incredible, amazing experience. And I think that small towns with tight-knit communities that like the town meeting model I think fosters that kind of, you know, um, direct democracy. It's, e it's easier to make that kind of collaborative film here. Great. So, <clears throat> what I'm hearing is a consistent thread of connectedness uh, because of Vermont's small size, because of the ability to engage a community, because of the ability to tour films and have an audience in these communities, the ability to start a conversation and to have the films in some ways become an event, which of course is very much part of the tradition of film, but one that frankly is getting lost in the year of streaming in particular where it becomes more of an individual consumer experience, which doesn't mean it doesn't have impact, but sometimes the filmmakers hard to know exactly what that is, especially as an independent filmmaker. But anyway, uh, that there are even marriage opportunities in all of this. <laughs> uh, uh, so the question then, the next question is, okay, it seems in many ways to be a fertile, promising, supportive, appropriate environment, especially for an independent filmmaker, and to, and to be able to both produce and reach audience, uh, and to know that audience. Uh, and a lot of this is about connection. So let's go through the list and talk about, in each case, just two challenges in making movies. In Vermont. We can start with Sydney again. Okay. Um, I think being an indie filmmaker is like the definition of challenging. So two challenges. <laughs> I think that I think money is always a big challenge. It's just a big challenge. It just really, really, really is. Um, there are certainly funding sources, local funding sources in Vermont and New Hampshire and New England that have enabled me to do and pursue independent work, but that's because I was in a privileged position of, you know, 
if the money didn't come in, I have a husband, I have a home, right? I wasn't going to be homeless if the grant didn't come through. And I was lucky the grants kept coming through, but you couldn't predict that. And without that kind of security, I couldn't have been an indie filmmaker at all. And so I think money is a huge challenge, and I think that's really the biggest one. I think other than that, like I was able to find community, crew, knowledge, you know, like all that was, was here and available, but being able to, you know, the underlying core, which I think is just missing for artists in the United States, is funding. Down the line? Sure. Okay. Well, yes, funding. I'm sure everyone's going to say that. Uh, I also feel that for certain kinds of films and filmmaking, uh, there isn't the same, there isn't the number of people available, like to find, say, a line producer in Vermont is not that easy to find. Uh, so I'm sure there are a sound person. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I get asked, do you know a sound, a good sound person? And there, I don't know that many. Actually, I, in fact, I only know, well, I know one, but he's really expensive and I wouldn't recommend him. And, uh, and like for my films, I've usually trained my sound people, which is okay, and I certainly don't mind doing that. Uh, but, uh, and, and also I think camera people too. I, I shoot my own documentaries, but I don't shoot narr my narrative films. and. I don't, I mean, there are a couple of people who shoot, who I would, who I've worked with actually in Vermont, but I think maybe more on the producing end, there's more of a lack. Like, like I said, line producer, a producer even, you know? So that's, those are my feelings. I uh, will not repeat the same information, but I feel the same. Um, I think that, you know, it's logistics I'm going to use as my one and my two because it's so big. There were so many logistical challenges uh, shooting in Vermont. Um, no cell service. Um, it, there, there was a time when, uh, though most of the production for my film was centered around a couple of towns, we couldn't find housing for the crew, so most of our crew came from New York, and where are we going to put them? And I just, it just seemed like, well, of course we'll figure something out, and um, ultimately we did, but, but prior, a few weeks prior to shooting, we, there was a chance that we were going to have to house people like 40 minutes away. And if that had happened, I don't, I, I, I think, you know, I don't know how people would have made do with that. It would have just been a very different experience. At the, at the end of very long days, people had to drive 40 minutes. And, um, and th these are just the kinds of things that typically don't go on in other places as nearby as New York and Massachusetts. And so, um, you know, that, that was really challenging, and it, and it worked for my film because the crew was 20 people, and, um, and because the community, we got the community involved, and because I didn't know any better, really. Um, but it was still, you know, it, it's the kind of thing where it gives you pause if you were to try to make a larger film, like how would you do it here? Um, so I will end there, though I could easily go on. Um, I was going to go for Wi-Fi and weather, um, and just yeah, the Wi-Fi, unbelievable challenge. And then the and then we had so many outside shots where we really just wanted to capture the beauty of Vermont. And we were so excited about it um, when we had it on on paper. And then you know you you have the schedule a week out, and you're like, is it going to rain Thursday? Now I think it's twenty percent. What does that mean? Like twenty percent of the state gets rain? I don't know. All this stuff that you're dealing with. Um, it's always a miracle when it works out, but yeah, but we love you. Um, I mean, I was going to do weather too, especially shooting this past July. Um, yeah, it was, but I think it actually ties directly into, into logistics, and I kind of want to hit a slightly different challenge with logistics that I faced. Um, 
think sort of tying a little bit into what Nora was saying, uh, getting getting a producer on board when the money is tight. Like you can pay people nothing to shoot a film, but to get a producer on for the year prior and you can't pay them anything, that's really tricky. Because um, the just the level of just work that goes into pre-production requires, and it's a full-time job for multiple people for multiple months. Um, and so having having to, to pull that together with limited resources, I think, is truly the biggest challenge. Um, and then um, a challenge that I faced is honestly just managing a team, like, and this might be me because I'm 26 years old, um, that, you know, a crew of 20 people for, for a 30 day shoot, if you're going over 12 hours every day, then like, you know, people are gonna start to get a little hot under the collar and figuring out how to manage that, especially if not everybody has a lot of experience shooting film and isn't maybe prepared for what it's gonna be like on day 27. Um, and fielding, fielding those expectations and making sure that everybody is, is ready to come to set the next day. And it's like, okay, yeah, everything changed, partly because it rained, partly because someone got sick, right? Maintaining that and keeping people excited and moving um, in this state, in this place where there isn't, there isn't the option to just, oh, we will bring somebody else in. When you're locked into a production, and not only can you not lose your cast, you really can't lose any crew. Just maintaining that experience of camaraderie and keeping this as a production people want to be on um, and, and are, are in love with because you're not being able to pay them very much. I find that to be one of the, the biggest challenges with just keeping the film going. And that might be a problem everywhere, but I, I don't need it. I'm one of the newest people to Vermont, I think, on the stage. Um, maybe tied with Willow, so I don't know that I'm the best authority on this. I'm definitely weathered. Most of the time I've spent in Vermont was as a cinematographer, and I remember on one of Bess's shoots, we had bright sun, overcast, rain, and hail, all within the period of covering one scene, which is just a continuity nightmare. Um, but I, the other thing that I'm noticing is, like, I'm hearing you all say that you don't know sound people, that we don't know producers, and I'm thinking, oh, like, we know this amazing line producer in Brattleboro, and I know an uh, amazing sound person who's just over the border in New Hampshire, so not technically Vermont. And it makes me think, realize that I feel like I don't know much about a film commission or a film office in Vermont, but like, there doesn't seem to be, even though I know most of these people on this panel, or at least connected by one degree of separation, we are all relatively siloed, it feels like. And so like this ability to do work share, to share resources, to share knowledge, to share experience, and share crew is really challenging, which perpetuates the fact that we all hire crews from New York and Boston. Whereas I feel like if there were some sort of connective tissue in this state, um, there might be the opportunity for us to, to start building more quickly um, on the crews and on the talent that is actually in the state. Yeah, I mean, I think that also, um, you know, when you're in Vermont, you're not, you're away from the industry, whatever the hell that means. And that's, in some ways, great, because you don't have to deal with all of that, those politics and those challenges. But you, you know, I think it's harder because you don't interface with people who are in New York or LA, um, who are, have a lot more connections to whatever it might be um, that you eventually would like your film to go to. Um, I think Jay and I um, either reconciled or gave up a long, long time ago when we were first in our careers and people were like, what are you doing in Vermont? What are you doing in Vermont? Why don't you go to LA? Why don't you go to New York? We didn't want to raise our family there. We weren't into it. Um, and so we sort of said the way we're going to make films is regional which means that our distribution is primarily going to be within the region. And it's, you know, if we get to film festivals, great. If we get a distribution deal, great. So I think that there's, there can sometimes also be from the industry sort of a, oh, aren't you guys cute in Vermont doing your little thing over there? And perhaps we're not always taken so seriously, which is a shame, because I think there's a lot of incredible regional work being done all over the country. And the idea that, festivals have gotten so siloed and there are, there are only really probably like three or four festivals that really any distributors or agents even come to anymore. Like why aren't distributors and agents coming to this festival? They should be. 
uh, but they're not. So I think that everything has gotten independent film 40 years ago is a lot easier. It's only gotten harder, in my opinion. It's gotten harder and harder and harder to do independent film because of the funding sources, because of the distribution, um, and because I think, you know, Miramax, for instance, said, this is great, we're gonna make this independent film, and they monopolized it, and now they're gone, but somebody else is in there. I mean, the last thing I would say is I think that there's such a huge shift away from film right now which is very interesting, partly because of COVID and partly because of this huge renaissance in television. And so television is really where it's at now. I mean, that is where people are just obsessed, including me and my husband, right? We're all obsessed with our Netflix and Amazon and Hulu shows. And so as, a, as an independent filmmaker, whether you're a documentary filmmaker or, or a dramatic filmmaker, where do you find your niche in that? Because television, and television series is really where everybody is looking right now. So, um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, what everyone else said, funding mostly number one. And but I, I don't think funding is a cinch anywhere else in the country. So, but um, and uh, being back in what Brad said, there's Angela Angela Snow and Jennifer Latham are two really great film people in Brattleboro. And they started the Northern Roots Film Collaborative to try to, it's mostly just a Facebook like private group, but if any of you guys, any filmmakers here in Vermont want to join, we're, we're trying to share resources more and like connections and stuff to get out of our silos. And I think that the more efforts to be made in that direction, the better. Um, yeah. Great. Um, um, Maybe, who here feels that they have had success <clears throat> in distributing their films? And if so, uh, what has been the nature of the success in terms of how much of it was self-distribution, how much of it was making a good connection with the distributor? Uh, and you can address that either from the question of financial success, which is extremely hard to find as an independent, but also just audience success, that you were pleased with the audience you were able to reach, or at least you saw a glimmer of possibility because you were able to reach certain audiences, and maybe if you had more time and more money and you know, were willing to take it further, you could have continued to develop it was too labor intensive. That's okay, but I still want to hear sort of glimmers of success in distribution. Signe, go ahead. Um. With Circus Dreams, which is uh, the film about Circus Circus, I felt like that was a really, I felt like I really reached an audience with that one, but that was largely because I went through, it was um, not picked up by PBS, which is a, a distribution network, but, by, but it was picked up by American Public Television. And then I spent about six months contacting every single program director across the United States, telling them, like, you need to show this film. And they did. And so that was a really interesting experience for me. So that was outside of Vermont, but I was able, and it was a pretty amazing feeling because I felt like it was a film about kids finding, like, their space. And then I did hear from a lot of young people that it had then something to them. So that felt really, really good that I was able to get that film into people's homes and I did it just by really calling, there's 250 program directors at public television stations across the United States. And I emailed them, I called them, I, you know, and, and I just, you know, kept bugging them until they showed the film. And that felt successful. But then with my next film, It's Criminal, which is about a Dartmouth College class that works with incarcerated women to write and perform a play. With that film, what I've really, really, really loved is how many small screenings we've had in libraries, in town halls, in classrooms, and the way that that, women I traveled often with some of the women from the film who were incarcerated and then they obviously got out, and they came to the screenings with me, and we've gone around New England, and. I have loved, loved, loved that process of making that connection with so many people, but also watching these women just 
become so articulate and so strong in making in in feeling like I'm part of like this journey where we can all start getting to know each other and breaking down those boundaries that separate us all. So I felt like I was so that you know I'm still we, if we finish that in 2017. Now we're on Zoom. We're still doing at least one or two showings a month, and I have to say that that's like one of the best parts of distribution ever. Cool. Just one very quick question: Did you get any revenue out of the American Public Television exposure? What? What? Did you I make any money out of the American <laughs> Public Television exposure? I made not a dime. Yeah. So I, I had pretty amazing. I had these sort of amazing funders for Circus Stream and they said that they're they wanted eyeballs and they asked how can we get eyeballs and I said we can get eyeballs this way we're not going to make any money and so they actually said all right how long is it going to take you I said if I had six months I can get this shown in every state I, I yeah. really can and they gave me that funding it wasn't yeah. much but you know not right. a dime and, and I have to say that when I when I spoke with these program directors they were like we are having fundraisers to keep the electricity on. So I'm not yeah. coming down on public sure. television. Like, they don't have any funding either. Yeah. OK, good. Well, let's see. I have I had two films in distribution. One uh, educational distributor, Cinema Guild, for Delivered Vacant, which was finished in 1993. Just to give you an idea about this whole issue of regionalism, though, I mean, this is a film that premiered at the New York Film Festival, it played at Sundance, and yet when we went to PBS, they said it was too local. So, and I feel like ever, I've, it, this has been a constant, a constant issue that has come up with making films about a place. Um, so it's frustrating because I feel very strongly that the local informs the national, but obviously some people don't feel that way. Um, but I should say that I, did a, my, I do my own distribution for that film, and to this day I still get lots and lots of people from, my web, from coming to my website and ordering that film. Now they're streaming it. So that has been my most successful film so far, and it still is ongoing. And it was a film completed in 1992, which is very, very interesting. The Vermont movie, we showed it all across Vermont and in libraries, but again, trying to get that film, a six-part series seen outside of Vermont, was very, very challenging. But we did show it all over Vermont, and that, I agree, I mean, it's fantastic to be able to do that. Uh, I have one film, a, a narrative film, that is uh, Monarch Films took it and put it on Amazon Prime, and I have no idea what it's doing. I've received not a penny from it, and it's been, you know, it's challenging. But um, anyway, Josh. Thank you. Um, so Major kind of did not play in the three or four festivals that Best mentions, and that was obviously a long shot for a small film, but at the same time, if you had asked me when we were submitting if I thought it would get in, I would say, no, of course not, it's not going to get in. But in the back of my head, I was thinking, it's going to get in, it's really going to, you know, like, and I could, I could envision it and it was exciting. And it didn't happen, and so we moved to the next tier of festivals, and it played at very good festivals, including here, and, um, and that was great and vindicating, and it played in London, and it played in Italy, and um, Australia, you know, at, at, at all these festivals, and that was really cool, and that felt like a, like a kind of success. Um, and then uh, we got a sales agent, and it took a long time, but we found a distributor called Good Deed Entertainment, and um, they had released a couple of movies that had just played at Sundance, and it seemed like they had some cool stuff going on, so that was a success. Um, and then, right around that time that COVID hit, um, they uh, interested Kino Lorber, which is like this great art house distributor, uh, and they said, we have this little movie, would you be interested in it? 
and they took it, and so that felt phenomenal. That was like a really, that was like a company that I knew and releases all of these amazing films. And they got the film into the Angelica in New York, which is a great art house theater that, you know, that, that felt like a huge success. By the same token, when the, when the box office returns came in, I was on these email threads that were between, that were among the distributors. Uh, and there were, you know, and it was just like, oh, it's, you know, it was like, they, they were just saying how terrible it was, you know, that, that it was making so little. Um, and, and that was sort of demoralizing, you know, they'd say like, uh, it was a Friday or, I think it was a Friday, then, or Monday that they got this report. And uh, they were like, but wait, we haven't gotten the ones from LA and San Francisco. Like, those should be good markets. And then they're like, oh, it's even worse than we thought. You know, it made like, a, like, you know, like $18, you know, at San Francisco the first weekend or something like that. Um, but then time went on, and I, felt, I still felt really good about the fact that, that People can see it, and, and it's done well when it went on to Amazon and iTunes, and, and then very recently, um, Showtime licensed it for their subscription service, and so they're paying a, not a ton of money, but a substantial amount of money, so that I can pay back the people that I owe money to, and uh, we'll have enough left over that I could take my family on um, like a short vacation. Um, but you know, like all things considered, that to me is like a very big success. Uh, and I'm, you know, proud of it. Thanks. Uh, such an interesting time to be talking about sharing a movie in the COVID world. Um, I mean, I think all, we, I'm sure I can speak for everyone, like all I want to do is sit in the theater and watch people watch the movie. and, and uh, um, and actually last night was sort of the first time I had that, so it was actually really cool, because um, all the other festivals we've gone to have been virtual. Um, we, we premiered at, um, at South By, and that was all virtual, so I watched things on the computer of like, I think there's a certain amount of people there watching, I don't know, there was some sort of comment section, not the same. Um, but, uh, you know, you keep moving, and you, you know, you, the, there are some Zoom things that are, are, have been exciting, and then um, we got um, picked up by Hulu a couple weeks ago, and that's been a big break. We're excited about it. By Hulu? Hulu. Um, I'd say the, the largest success that I've had with distribution um, for Zephyr, which was here in 2016, is that we went to a bunch of other festivals around the country. Um, which was really big for me uh, as a 21-year-old. So, you know, oh, whoa. Um, and yeah, did, did well at those festivals. No, no distribution deals. Um, you know, self-released it online on Vimeo, and it's still out there on the website, Um And yeah, that's so for me that level of success with distribution is something that I would say I'm still still searching for and still um, I'd love to pick everyone's brains um, having just wrapped on on a larger feature this summer on um, ways that we can move forward and try to maximize our distribution and our eyeballs so yeah um, one thing that I think both best and Willa can talk more about but one thing that this is more an answer to your first question actually Jay one of the things that I've loved is I've the Vermont audiences that we have engaged with with our films, it feels like are less cinephiles and more something else. And so we've often, the two documentaries that we've screened in Vermont, um, Willow's documentary Break the Silence and then Sisters Rising, which played here virtually last summer, we partnered with some sort of social justice organization with Break the Silence, it was Vermont Access, and with um, Sisters Rising, it was the Winton World County Affairs something. Council. Um, and the network, Vermont Network Against Sexual Violence. And Vermont Violence. Network Against Sexual Violence and for Break the Silence. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just, I mean, we filled the theater. We raised a shit ton of money for these organizations. Um, there was huge community conversation. People would come up to Willow in the grocery store the next day and brag about their vasectomies. It was, I mean, it was just like an amazing community experience. Um, and I'll let, Willow does most of the distribution for our films beyond that, but 
Um, as far as like local screenings, we found that trying to attract audiences not because of just your film, but because of your film and something else that is involved in the community tends to bring a lot of success. And best you're the wizard or witch as far as that's concerned. Well, I don't know about that, but um, yeah, I mean, I guess I would talk about, uh, I've made, I don't know, eight or nine documentaries, but the one that really broke for me was this film called The Hungry Heart, and that was timing, um, which is, of course, everything in any kind of arts, whatever you want to do, whether you want to be an actress or you want to be a filmmaker, if you happen to make something or be there at the right moment, it can change a lot. But I, I made a film about the prescription drug opiate epidemic uh, in 2013, and that was just when it was happening in Vermont. And so when we released it, it was, I mean, just everybody was talking about this issue, and so this film took, you know, it, it just set, set everything, it was on fire. And what happened from there is that um, I had asked the governor many times to come to a screening and he never got there, but somebody handed him a DVD and said, you have to watch this. He watched it and he called me a couple of weeks before his state of the state and said, whoa, I saw this film, The Hungry Heart. This is a huge issue in our state. And would you mind if I you, you know, referenced your film in my state of the state and honored the people in the film, which as a filmmaker, I was like, of course. And so he did that and that particular speech became a national event because no um, no governor had ever spent their entire state of the state speaking about one thing, and this governor spoke the entire time about the opiate epidemic, and referenced my film, talked about my film, and so this was picked up by national press, um, partly because the idea that Vermont had an opiate problem was like, what the heck? For beautiful Vermont, Ben and Jerry's, the whole thing, how could you possibly have a problem? And so then that broke nationally into, oh my God, if Vermont has an opiate problem, then the whole country does because we're not talking about it. Um, and so the next day, I was, yeah, I was getting phone calls from MSNBC and CBS, and all of a sudden I was getting distribution, you know, calls, and every single conference for every single possible opiate problem or addiction problem called me and wanted to show my film. So my film played around the country in many, many communities around this particular issue who, who were like, oh my God, we have this problem. Let's use your film, as Brad said, to bring the community together and have a conversation. So I toured that film for like two and a half years all over the country because of that particular moment that this happened. Um, and it was, yeah, it was one of the first films that really addressed the rural aspect of the opiate problem, um, which I don't think the United States was really wanting to deal with at that moment and then had to. Um, so that was probably, you know, that will probably never happen to me again, but it did happen. Um, and it was very exciting. Um. So new, new Day Films and Women Make Movies are the two distributors we've worked with so far and I feel like we're just getting started so I don't, I mean, I kind of feel like we succeeded at doing educational distribution because I have friends who succeeded at it and kind of were gatekeepers that helped me in, especially with New Day. Alan Dater and Lisa Merton are amazing documentary filmmaker, filmmaking couple in Southern Vermont who, um, she basically like got me into New Day Films which is an, um, it's an educational distribution cooperative like run by and for documentary filmmakers, usually kind of social issue driven documentaries. And we market our own films individually but work together as a collective and you pay a certain share into the collective to make it run. And I've, I found that um, way more rewarding than women make movies. I love women make movies, they're incredible. They're based out of New York and they've been around since I think the 60s, um, but we get, a much higher share from our revenue from um, royalties from Break the Silence, which is, you know, less glitzy of a film. Like Sisters Rising is more, it's on PBS, it's on America Reframed. But I'm making more money almost through New Day because I'm doing the work and I'm making the lion's share of the revenue. So I totally recommend that to anyone. If you want to talk to me about New Day films, it's amazing. Incredible community too. It can be lonely in Vermont. You know, I don't get to see JFS. They're in the Northeast Kingdom or in Southern Vermont. Like, um, so New Day Films is a national collective of filmmakers and it's just an incredible resource. And I do feel like gatekeeping is a 
huge film is all about who you know and what they're gonna share with you and even down to like what do I charge a corporation who wants to screen my film you know I don't even know what's normal I usually undersell myself and then kick myself later and so New Day really helps like being like no 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 this is you know start high and then negotiate down so I've learned a lot um, and that's one thing I'm going to say also to the first question of or maybe it was the second question of um, difficulties in Vermont I mean, we're rarely in the position of like being able to hire other people, but when we do, we're always trying to hire, you know, with an eye towards diversity and representation, and that's just really hard in Vermont. Like, um, with Sisters Rising, it was our mandate to hire indigenous women first, and just finding, like, it was just, even nationally, it was hard to find indigenous women in film who could, we could hire for different roles, but in Vermont, it's very, very white, and I'm white, but, you know, we try to hire diversely, and like, lifting up all boats and it's just kind of hard in Vermont sometimes. And I wish I, you know, going to what Beth said, how could there be an opiate addi you know, addiction problem in Vermont? Like, there's so much racism in Vermont too that needs to be confronted and I hope we can help do that as filmmakers in Vermont. Great. Yeah, and one note on that point, um, Clemens Family Farm, you know, in uh, Charlotte, which is an African-American family that is sort of created a cultural center there, does have a network that they've built of more than 200 um, African-American artists in the state. Now, I don't think there are a lot of filmmakers there, but there are people who are actors and musicians and other types of people, and it'd be worth checking with them at some point, you know, and maybe starting to stimulate some interest in, you know, in what we're doing in film. So, we yeah, don't have a lot of time more, but I'd like to go through one more time, and, you know, there's not a lot that, you can't take a lot of time, sort of run over here. But you know, given I think this I think it's all been sort of interesting, it's great to hear from people and, and get this perspective. And, and part of what it's saying to me is that there is a robust film community in Vermont, despite significant challenges, especially in financing and logistics and infrastructure, all of which are lacking. So what you know if you say what would success look like? for a Vermont film industry. What would success look like within the realm of what could potentially be achieved? What would come to mind? Come on through. Um, I think that universal, wi universal high-speed Wi-Fi would be huge and self-service reception. Like it's, and I think those are things that would be huge for Vermont, not only for filmmaking, but for basically a lot of the new businesses and startups and things that would draw people to a rural state. And however Vermont can do it, I really hope that we can, and also just for kids in general, for education, if we could do high-speed internet and cell reception. Because among other things, Vermonters could also stream your films, which in many cases they cannot right now. And this would be the market where you could most easily reach that audience. Yeah, absolutely. And monetize it, maybe better than American public television. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, it, that's a hard question, I think. Uh, this And my answer addresses the money issue. And, you know, there are a lot of wealthy people in Vermont. but. Actually, and there's not a lot of money that goes to the arts. If you look at what the Vermont Arts Council gives for individual creation grants, it's not a lot. And I'm wondering if, I've always thought that, given the fact that there are wealthy individuals in Vermont, that there should be some kind of investment pool or pool of investors, people who would be willing and interested in, like, um, what is it called? Venture fund people, angel investors, a, a group of angel investors that would consider projects and consider investing in projects. Similar to that, I think if there, I mean, Vermont doesn't offer any, at least at the time that I was making my film, did not offer any incentives. Um, and when Massachusetts and New York do offer film incentives for, you know, or are actively trying to get productions going, 
in the states, it makes it very difficult, especially if you're, you go above a certain uh, budget threshold to make a film here. Um, it, you know, it, if somebody's an invest, if an entity is investing a significant amount of money in your film, and you could do it much more cheaply across the border, it's very hard to make a case for um, for shooting here. Uh, despite the fact that there are so many incredible things about about Vermont, and I, I will say that for my film, even though the, the crew came from out of state, uh, they all worked for much less than they would have if they were in New York, and they came up here because um, they got to spend five weeks in the height of summer in Vermont, and so they wanted to do that, and they wanted that experience. And the same is true for why so many artists come here. It's just a wonderful place. And it would be great if there was just, you know, more backing from the state because it, it really could be so much more than it is, I think. I was just thinking that I, we've made movies in Los Angeles and then Vermont and thinking of like the problems that you have in LA are like, don't exist in Vermont. And the problems you have in Vermont don't exist in LA. And, I'm not advocating for Vermont to like become like LA, but um, just maybe just more awareness of, of movie and, and the the, um, the network that exists there. You know, of all these folks on the stage, um, if Vermonters knew more about um, you know the great movies that are happening here, they'll be more open and more opportunities and more funding and all that. Yeah, I think I mean, whatever what everyone has already said. Um, and for me specifically, I think that a lot of success for the film industry would be success for the state as a whole in um, sort of other capacities, and that's figuring out a way to keep more young people in the state, um, which is like the elephant in the room of every discussion about Vermont, is that we're, I mean, <laughs> I don't know very many people my age who stuck around in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, and, you know, the, the crew that I had this summer um, was mostly under 25. And some of those people came from out of state, they came just for the production. The people who were in state Vermonters, um, I think close to half of them left just now and are not coming back. And they were here because of coronavirus, you know, back at their parents' places. Um, and so, I think that, that high-speed um, Wi-Fi, broadband, and cell service is a huge aspect of that. And I think that um, just Vermont as a state uh, kind of committing to a little bit more radicalization um, in, in certain aspects of, of just the infrastructure and the cultural image. I think that we are not marketing the state as a particularly exciting place right now, um, certainly not for people in their 20s. Um, it's it's a safe place and it's a good place to raise your family and it's a very stable place um, but those are not reasons why people my age want to be, want to be somewhere um, and so I think at least the way I see it to sort of keep a film industry going in this state and sort of build one up we need to do a better job of marketing Vermont as a yeah um, just as a place for young people, and I, I don't have all the answers to that, but I think that's a huge piece of success for film in this city. Um, I mean, I think just two things real quick, and but I wanted to say I don't, I'm not an authority, it's not a monolithic viewpoint out here. I don't know that we actually have robust filmmaking in Vermont. I think we have a robust community of filmmakers. And um, when I worked in the Northwest, I did a, quite a few shoots in Portland, and I couldn't throw a rock on a set of Portland that wouldn't hit someone who trained under Gus Van Sant. Mm. And the idea that just three or four films that were shot and committed to a region um, helped build a crew, I mean, it's something KCP and Bess and Jay have seen, is that, but it's something we need more film shooting in Vermont, and for that we need more money to shoot films in Vermont. And I think if we could get an influx in uh, money I think it would be amazing. The other thing that I want to say is that the grant funding that we've looked into in Vermont and New England is not enough to make it home. 
It's not, an, it's not enough to raise other funds to make a film. It is a, a pittance. And similarly, similarly, the commissioned work from organizations in Vermont is not sustainable. And so something that I think, I don't think it's fair to ask us all to protect and force reasonable day rates, but I think communicating day rates, communicating the fact that we are working at a third or a quarter or a pittance of what we would earn, and that we can't actually earn an income and a living on that, I think that's something we need to do in a united way. We need to raise our day rates. And then we can have, you know, I think that would also help upcoming and emerging filmmakers stay here too. So. Yeah, I mean, money, 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 money. I mean, what Nora said and everybody said. I mean, the point is also, when you shoot a film, certainly a feature film, you know, the amount of impact of tax dollars is gonna help that community. I mean, you've got 20 people, 50 people, grip scalpers, you know, you're needing to put them up. They're having to have their cafe, cafe lattes. They're driving around. They're, they're impacting these communities. And that is something that we need the state to identify and to respect and say, this is a good thing. And when the commission was here, and I was on the commission a long time ago, part of the challenge was that they were only focused on bringing Hollywood here, which is fine. Um, but they also were not, in my opinion, really working to stabilize and support filmmakers who lived here. And I think Brad's right. I mean, you know, how, I mean, this is just the plight of artists, right? It's like, oh, no, no, it's okay. I'll work for $10 an hour. It's like, no, man, like, that can't happen anymore. You get to a certain age and it's like, I'm not going to do that anymore. And, um, you know, the, the grants in Vermont and in the country are pathetic. Um, for the arts and for film and, you know, <laughs> take it up, you know, use it as a clarion cry. It needs to be, you know, artists need to be uh, really vocal, more vocal um, in just saying, you know, we, we need support. And we all know that the arts and film and touring and showing and screening in communities is, it helps communities be healthy and creates dialogue. And um, if, if we can't do that, then it's a disservice to our to our state. Yeah, I would just add housing. And like Liam was saying, I mean, I, want, I think healthy communities are intergenerational communities. And we all heard about the, you know, aging Vermont. And I love and care about our elderly and older people. And I feel like I'm becoming an old person rapidly myself. But I want like young people to come, I want young people to stay, and um, housing is a huge problem in Southern Vermont, and I think second homes is a huge problem. I think Vermont being seen as like a vacation state, um, I was having a conversation with my friend the other day, she was like, your road is just so beautiful, like I talked to our, we talk to our neighbors all the time, it feels super vibrant, and it is all ages on our road, and she lives like really nearby, but it's mostly second homes on her road, it's just dead, like she doesn't even know, she doesn't talk to them most of the time, and I, like, can we ban second homes, you know? Can we do, can we just raise the taxes on second homes so high that it just, you know, like, I want people, like, my friend Janine, she's my first friend I've made in COVID, she's the only friend I made during COVID, and she moved here from LA, she's a filmmaker, she came with her family, and she is going to stay, I hope, but, like, I feel almost this desperation when I make friends my age in Vermont, and I'm like, please don't leave, you know? Like, I'm committed to being here, but, uh, it's good to hang out with pe your peers and feel like there's a vibrancy, you know, and um, so yeah, I hope housing, the fiber, you know, better coverage. It's just sort of basic, like if you have, and Vermont has the potential to be just, it has such an incredible community fabric if we can help retain that. And so, right. You know, I'm going to offer just a thought or two. Um, I mean, what we do as Vermont filmmakers is essentially work in what I would call a cultural cinema as opposed to a commercial cinema. And which isn't to say that cultural cinema can't reach large audiences. It can. Spike Lee is a cultural filmmaker. You know, P.T. Anderson ultimately is, is a cultural filmmaker. I mean, these are people drawing from, from, from rich narratives, character-driven stories, etc. But the United States, and Vermont in particular, do not have a commitment to this form of, of cultural media. The national PBS system has no commitment to narrative, for example. WGBH puts 
some 20 or 30 million dollars a year into BBC and was one of the supporters of Down and Abbey, but, has, but does not commit to New England regional film. We have two or three festival films this year from Canada that have were produced as a result of a program in Canada for first-time filmmakers based on script only that awards these filmmakers $175,000 to make their first film. I was on a panel some years ago in London about public financing of film, and I remarked that in Canada and the European Union, television rights sold by statute for a minimum of $500,000. So the producers would not be cannibalized by a commercial industry. One of the members of the panel said, no, you're wrong. It's $900,000. He said, I know because I'm the head of Telefilm Canada. So, you know, we accept a certain marginalized status financially within this cultural realm. And we accept that culture is not considered important as an industry in the state of Vermont, despite the fact that it's one of the most important industries. And I just, you know, I, I don't think, I think that we can solve the problem if we could move a couple of key elements in the equation. Vermont Public Television tried, went, went to sell a bandwidth to bidders that came into play to buy, to acquire bandwidth for media. They were hoping to get $9 million for the sale. They sold it for $56 million. And when I think about all of this, I think that you know a minimum of $10 million should be put into an endowed fund to support media development in the state of Vermont that would yield about 600000 not a whole lot of money, but enough money that it would give the basis to go out and start organizing more money. It would be better if it was $20 million, but you know, we're not going to argue. We'll take $10 million. But in some ways, you know, for a public out media outlet that auctioned a public commodity that is by statute public property to not be committing to indigenous media development, I think is problematic. Now then you get into the next realm of that means you're going to deal with the politics of that. And nobody, Vermont is a state that doesn't like to confront hard issues like this. But I, for one, think that we really have to think about maybe a unified approach. Because $3,000 grants from the Vermont Arts Council, which is what you get for a film project, are negligible. They don't pay the, the fringe benefits on a week's worth of payroll. You know, and it's true. And in my case, I've shot most of the last four films I've made in Massachusetts. Because on the film I just made, Martin Eden, the state of Massachusetts, gave us $240,000. With no questions asked. I didn't have to go lobby anybody or convince anybody that this is the way it is. I'm not saying that Vermont will ever do that. I don't think Vermont has the resources to support a film incentive fund. But I do think that there has to be some move to recognize the existence of the, of the media producing community to do what Liam says also, to make this a place where young people can come and start making movies. And, and, and if you have that entity in place, it could begin to identify infrastructure, it could lobby for Wi-Fi, it could assemble a crew list, it could, it could oversee some training of crew, it could help to build out a, a local grassroots distribution network, it could sell the films into the larger PBS system, it would get obviously rights to show the films. But it would be a way to start combining and integrating the, the various needs that we've described here. You know, I for one have pushed this and I've talked to the to Scott Finn about it. But I think that we need I think we can't just take an easy no for an answer. And so I for one would like to continue to be in contact and for us to try to figure out a strategy 
that may include even making a public demand of sorts for the media community in Vermont has achieved a lot. You know, there was a time back in the old days of, you know, where the rivers flow north, the man with the plan, and my mother's early lovers, where you could point to Vermont as a unique state that had its own cinema. And, and could play films around the state to large audiences. But you know, we, I think we just, there's, we have a resource, we have multi-generations right here on the stage, and I think that uh, we don't want to get together five years from now and tell the same stories. So anyway, I'd like to be in touch, and I thank you very much. I think this has been a good conversation. We all deserve some bubbly. We deserve some bubbly. <laughs>